Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. This is part two of the Commodore 1084 repair. So in the previous episode we found that the flyback was faulty and we also looked at some blooming issues that I have with the 1084S up there. So today we're going to replace the flyback in this faulty 1084 and see if it suffers from those same blooming issues. So if you haven't seen the previous episode definitely check that out first before watching this one. Let's do it. So this is our replacement flyback here. As I mentioned, it comes from HR Demon and I ordered this off Wagner Australia. So it only took a few days to arrive and it cost about $70 Australian. So we're gonna get this installed and uh, yeah, see what it does. Now, the way I determined which flyback to order was simply by looking up this part number on the original flyback here. So. There are a few that are labeled AT2079, but this number down here, 30102, was the actual number that I searched for on HR Demon's website. And that led me to their replacement version, which is a HR7506. So pinouts look the same. Um, and yeah, everything else looks pretty similar. I mean, these pots are a little bit different, but um, yeah. This should be the correct flyback for this particular CRT. So first things first, we need to get this old one disconnected from the neck board. So there is a wire here, which actually goes up to where a focus trim pot normally is. On the other Commodore 1084S that I've got up there, oh, it's not a 1084S, it's just a 1084. The focus control is actually on the neck board itself, but uh, obviously, this flyback is slightly different and it has the focus control on the flyback itself. So a little bit of a difference there. So um, yeah, definitely check the flyback that you've already got in the original monitor before you go ordering a replacement. Let's get this thing out. And I guess we'll start with just removing this cable and this cable tie. One down, one to go. So to get this part out of the uh, neck connector, we need to pop off this little plastic cover here. So it is just kind of clipped around this part here. So there is a clip there and a clip there, which looks to have already been slightly damaged. So maybe this has already been done before. Let's just see if we can get this off without breaking it any further. Some of these plastics will go fairly brittle over time from the excess heat that builds up. So that seems to have come off in one piece. Now the lead here is actually soldered in. Uh, I've had other flybacks where the lead is just sort of, it just sort of pressure fits in there. So it's not actually soldered to anything, but um, this one's been soldered and there is a little bit of what looks like burn mark here. So I think somebody has been in here and has been at this before. Let's just see if we can get this out without melting any of the plastic around it. There it goes. Right, it is out. There's a lot of solder on that little point. All right, there we go. Now, the other one. So this lead should go back through here. And then this lead goes back in through here. Cool, that is all solid. We can reinstall the little cap wherever I put it. Nice, ready. 
Now, the other thing I want to check before I put the new fly back in is just this uh, horizontal output transistor. Make sure it hasn't shorted because uh, sometimes a blown flyback will short out the components connected to it. Um, a lot of them are just connected between various turns of the flyback itself. So a short can potentially destroy some of the stuff around it. And usually the horizontal output transistor is the first suspect. So let's just stick the multimeter in diode mode. All right, so looking between base and emitter, that looks to be open and base and collector looks like it's short. Let's just switch these around. Uh, base and collector, standard drop. And again, base and emitter look to be a short, but that may not be the full story. Let's just switch over to resistance. 5.6 ohms resistance between base and emitter. And there is something on this side of the board here that looks to connect potentially back around. Uh, let's just see what that is. Ah, right. There's a resistor here of, I'm not gonna be able to see it, but that, that resistor there is 5.6 ohms, so. So that more than likely explains the resistance that we're seeing and why it looks like a short when we're testing it in diode mode. Let's actually get the replacement flyback back in. <sighs> All right, that was frustrating, but it is finally in. Um, the pins just all had the slightest little bend to them and that just stopped everything from lining up perfectly. All right, our flyback is in and everything looks nice and shiny. Now I did also notice that some of the transistors on this board have really long legs. Like if we look over here, just look at how much they stick out of the board. I could, I could even just push those two together and it would short that thing out. So I'm just gonna go around and clip off some of these extra long legs here. Cause uh, yeah, there, there's a chance that if something pushes down on the bottom of the board, you're gonna create shorts everywhere. And it's it's like that all over the board here. So I'm just gonna do some quick leg trimming. All right, I feel better about that. I don't think anything's gonna short out to itself. Okay, so the other thing I'm gonna do is just set the focus and screen controls just to their midway position, because uh, who knows what they're actually set to at the moment. That one looks like it was maxed out. That was the focus. And the screen control was also maxed out. So don't really want to start this thing up with both controls being maxed out. So yeah, they're just at their halfway positions. Let's reinstall this and power it up. All right, so the monitor has been reassembled and everything's been reconnected. So we should be able to plug this back in and see what happens. Now I'm not expecting any major faults because this did kind of work before we took the old flyback transformer out. The problem was the flyback itself, but uh, if there was a major issue, it would have actually blown the fuse in the power supply in this thing. Dare I say everything else should just work as normal, unless of course this replacement flyback has issues and then, well, we'll see what happens. So uh, let's plug it in and find out. Power on. Ooh, I heard a nice snap, crackle and pop from the high voltage. So uh, that's a good sign. And whoa, that has turned up way too high. Let's power that back off for a second. I'm gonna turn the uh, screen voltage down, which is the little pot on the back of the flyback transformer. All right, power this back on. Yes, so the slightest little adjustment to the screen pot makes the uh, raster disappear. So um, yeah, that looks better, but uh, I guess now we need to connect an actual source to this to see what it actually looks like. 
And yeah, just a slightest adjustment to that little screen pot, just turning it down a little bit, uh, gets rid of all those retrace lines because if you can see those, then it means your flyback screen voltage is set way too high. I'm just gonna check the B plus voltage. Uh, that is one of the things that tripped me up with the Commodore 1084 SP monitor up there. After I replaced the flyback in that one, the B plus voltage was really low and it was causing all kinds of weird issues. Um, so I think after replacing a flyback, it's uh, probably a good idea to check the B plus voltage. And that is laid out in the service manual itself. So according to the service manual, it says with the unit off, set the volume control, contrast and brightness to minimum. So let's do that. Preset R114 to mechanical center and connect a voltmeter across C494. Adjust R114 for a reading of 125 volts on the meter. Now I know R114 is on the power supply board. Uh, that's going to be a little bit tricky to see at the moment, but it is this little trim pot just here. Uh, C494 <laughs> is buried in there. Uh, there might be a better way or a better spot to check this at. So yeah, C494 is that capacitor just in there, that big black one. Um, not the easiest thing to hook a voltmeter up to, uh, but there is R494, which is a 68K resistor in parallel to it. And that is right next to that capacitor. Still not the easiest thing to hook onto, but uh, easier than trying to get to the underside of that capacitor. Now the other side is just connected to ground, so we can just clip one end to ground. That's quite easy. All right, so I've just clipped on a lead to this metal ground plate here. This is definitely a safe ground. It's the same as the ground around the CRT. And the other lead is clipped onto one side of resistor R494. So if we power this thing on, we should see 125 volts. But if not, we can adjust this guy over here on the power supply, um, just with a ceramic or plastic tool, preferably, and uh, make it to 125 volts. Let's power this back up. All right, we're seeing 125.4. Let's just give it the slightest turn, see how much of a difference it actually makes. Oh, we're going up. Yeah, it only takes the slightest turn to make that voltage change. So if it's close to 125, probably safe to just leave it alone. All right, now we'll hook up a source and see what this thing looks like. All right, so once again, I've just locked the exposure on the camera and at the moment it looks pretty good. Everything I just set to its midway position and uh, yeah, the screen looks pretty nice. Now let's see what affects the contrast and brightness have. Okay, so maxing out the contrast, it does still bloom a little bit. And maxing out the brightness also contributes to that, but yeah, it's not as bad as the other one, which definitely blooms a lot more. Maybe not quite as good as the 1084 I've got with its original flyback, but um, certainly doesn't seem as bad as my 1084 SP replacement flyback. And yeah, swapping through screens in the test suite, I can see that it does sort of shrink in a little bit as we change through the screens, but still not too bad. Colors up a bit high though. Uh, let's look at the white square. Yeah, it does sort of stretch out towards the bottom, but again, Nowhere near the extent of the other one that I have. Yeah, it's it's decent and I haven't adjusted the focus yet, so probably should do that as well. Uh, in fact, let's do that now. Oh, before we adjust the focus, I should adjust the, uh, the screen pot just to its ideal position, which it may already be in. 
So there is a bit of a debate about the best way to adjust the screen pot, but I usually have an input signal coming in that has a black background and the contrast and brightness set to their mid position. And I'll pretty much bring up the screen pot to where I can see the black background gets uh, slightly dark gray and then just bring it slightly back down. Ooh, it's very sensitive. Just to there, just so the black background is black again, obviously turning up the brightness, that's the contrast, turning up the brightness will reveal gray in that back, in that black background, but um, yeah, having it set midway results in a pretty natural looking image. And uh, yeah, colors look good. All right, let's just set the uh, focus, which also looks fairly good, but we might be able to squeeze a bit more out of it. So setting the focus, I'm just pretty much just looking for where I can see the scan lines in the middle of the screen. The corners of the screen, it's hard to get perfect focus, but just aiming at the middle of the screen, good focus looks to be right around that spot there. Well, that looks really nice. There's also a good range in the colors, so everything sort of starts off pretty evenly. So I don't think I'll even need to adjust any of the biasing or the color drives. Everything looks pretty good. Yeah, gray ramp looks good. Color purity looks good. I'm not seeing any issues there. Just bring the overscan out a little bit. Uh, thankfully, there's simple controls on the back for this. No hidden service menus or anything. Convergence is a bit, yeah. The center looks good, but there's definitely a separation up here, up in this sort of area. This corner looks good, that corner looks good. Yeah, it's more along the top, especially in this corner where it's not perfect, but looking at a screen like this, you can't really tell. Cool, so yeah, this thing looks pretty damn good. Now, out of curiosity, I am gonna have a look and see what the high voltage reading looks like. Uh, remembering that the 1084 that I'm having issues with had a variance of 2200 volts between the lowest brightness setting and the highest. And the good 1084 that I've got only had a variance of 800 volts. So let's see what this one looks like. All right, high voltage probe is ready. Let's see what we get. So about 25 kilovolts, which is pretty average at average brightness. Coming up to 25.6 and dropping to 23.9. So between 25.6 and 23.9. Math. So a difference of about 16 or 1700 volts from full brightness to complete black on this flyback. Uh, it's not terrible. It's obviously not as good as the other Commodore original flyback that I've got, but it's also not as bad as the replacement one that I've got in that other Commodore monitor. Uh, and it does show even just from looking at the screen, uh, I can see that there isn't as much blooming. There is still more than the original one, but yeah, nowhere near as bad as the one up there. So I'd be happy to run this one. I'm still certainly not happy with the level of blooming that I've got from that one up there. 
Okay, so it's been about a week and this thing is still running just fine. So I'm pretty satisfied that everything is working correctly. Now there are a couple more things that I wanna do with this particular monitor, but I won't do them in this video because it's been about 20 minutes long now. So we'll split that off into another video sometime down the track, but there are a few other adjustments that I wanna make, namely to the uh, geometry and convergence. But uh, before I do that, I actually wanna add a SCART input to this. There is an unpopulated space on the board for a SCART input, uh, but yeah, obviously it's not there. There is also an analog RGB input in the form of a DIN connector, um, but that's a bit of a pain in the ass to use compared to just a simple SCART socket. So I'll be adding one of those in a future video and we'll do some fine tuning with the convergence. Um, at the moment, it's just running through S-Video, just through a little DIN uh, to two RCA connector looks something like this. So those are pretty easily found on like Amazon or AliExpress or whatever. And um, yeah, you can pick them up for a couple of bucks usually, but it does help for these older Commodore monitors that have two RCA inputs versus the more standard mini DIN S video input because these obviously predate the S video standard. So pick one of those up if you've got a Commodore monitor that has the Luma Chroma inputs and you wanna use something with S-Video to go to them. But um, yeah, for doing fine tuning adjustments with convergence and stuff like that, I'd much rather have RGB. It's just a little bit cleaner than the S-Video signal and it helps when you're looking at, you know, I wanna say per pixel, but there's no pixels in a CRT, per shadow mask hole uh, adjustments. So um, yeah future video for that but uh, for now this thing is up and running and yeah I'm happy that it's working so as always thanks for watching the retro channel a massive thanks to the people that support the channel on patreon and youtube memberships if you want to do the same links are down below but uh, if you want to just like share subscribe all that uh, youtubey stuff am I sounding like another youtuber right now possibly anyway um, thanks for watching see ya